Hello, hello. Welcome to Row Faster Series Part 9, the data episode. So well done if you've got this far. I don't know if you've maybe just seen this and clicked on it. There's a whole nother eight that you can go check out. It's basically just me breaking down everything about rowing and my approach to coaching that in a way that you can go and implement it. So this one's on data. Again, something that's very new to rowing, something that in my opinion, rowing is very far behind on. You look at all the sports with money, like that aren't even that data driven, like hockey, football, you know, it's much harder to quantify the data from those, but because they have money, they see the value in using it. But for some reason with rowing, there's just this attitude towards it that it's not important. Yeah, and in my opinion, it's a big part why rowing is getting left behind. Uh, but again, I don't want to get too much into the, like the politics and the reasoning behind it. Uh, I just want to bring to your attention that for some reason, rowers don't like to use it. The kind of one of the common arguments I hear is that, you know, you can overthink it, you can overanalyze it. You can make too many decisions based off of it. It can be something that, you know, is is just another excuse for you not to perform on the day. Now, for me, I think that you should be able to have lots of information and not be put up, off by it. I don't think you should just avoid using data because you think that it could possibly be something that is going to put you off. I think, you know, the analogy I use is like with social media, like when you're going to bed, you should be able to have your phone beside your bed and not pick it up. You should be able to have that control. And in the same way, you should be able to have data from your training and not let it influence everything about your, your training. And for me, with the athletes that I work with, we're very careful in the way that we manage it, but it's also a very, very good tool, tool uh, in order to get the best program for an individual. Now, of course, for this is probably the more individual approach. It's my approach for rowing if you're in a team it's going to be a bit harder i don't know how you would adapt the program based on the data you'd obviously have to take averages across the squad uh but for me my approach it's all about figuring out what's going to be best for the individual and data is one of the tools that i use in order to get that so it's not the be all and end all as i said you shouldn't make all of your decisions based off of it uh, remember, it's a tool. There's going to be times when you're probably going to want to ignore it. And there's going to be times when you maybe don't even want to track it. So examples like that are maybe when you're coming back from an illness and you're looking at your heart rate. Uh, sometimes it can be climbing too quickly. Uh, and that's just a sign that you maybe have lost some some sharpness. You know, you might, you might it might be off putting for you. So you can maybe just leave it for then. Or if you're coming back from an off season or a rest and, you know, your heart rate's going all over the place, it might actually not be that useful of um information for you. But in general, it's one of the best ways that we can track progress. It's one of the best ways that you can find out what's going to be best suited to you. Now, in terms of tracking data from your training alone, so just like what you actually do while you're rowing, I think the two, if you could only track one, it would be the duration. So how long you rode for, again, this is very simple. The next one would be what splits and speeds you held over that duration. And then the third one within your training is going to be your heart rate. Um, it's really, really good for on like a macro scale, being able to track it. And again, I'm going to show you some examples of like some of the athletes and good examples of how, how, um, we were able to see how they were progressing and how we were able to see what sort of training they were responding really well to. And also seeing like how quickly they were able to respond to things and what was the optimum amount of a recovery week? What was the optimum amount of load in a heavy week or a heavy training block in order to get the best out of them in a way that sees them coming out of it higher than they were before. So duration, split or speed slash power, and then heart rate, track those over a long amount of time. Uh, probably the easiest way I think you can do this is to link erg data with Strava. And also if you're tracking on a watch or your phone uh, to link that with Strava as well. Strava is probably just one of the easiest ways to go back and look at all your training information. I started doing it in 2019 and I wish I started doing it sooner. I started tracking all of my erg screens in 2018. Again, I wish I started doing it sooner. The best time to start tracking your data was the first day you started training. The second best time to start tracking your data is today. Now, in order of importance from like a daily sort of measuring perspective of what I think is most important is the first piece of information you can track. Again, there's, you can do this so many ways, like notes on your phone, obviously, if you wanna get a Google Sheets app, um, I'm sure there's plenty of other software out there. So 
the first thing I think you should be tracking, uh, and for me is the most useful piece of information is probably the least scientific measurement. And that is very simply perceived shape. So <clears throat> on a scale of zero to a hundred, how do you feel? How are your energy levels? Now the kind of, to give you some references, when I'm explaining it to my athletes, I say a hundred feels like the best day, one of the best days you ever had. You feel like you could get on the yard right now and pull a PB or you could run through a wall. That's a hundred. And then if you're anything less than like 10, that's like calling an ambulance. Uh, but in general, if you're kind of in between the 60 to 85 mark, that's probably normally where you'd sit during training. Um, if you're anything less than like 50, that's generally when you'd say, okay, you're probably maybe getting a bit ill or that's when you want to back off. But again, perceived shape is very subjective. There's some people who are always in the 40 to 60 range and always sitting there. And again, once you know the athlete, or of course, once you know what you're like, you know relatively what that means. And there's some people who are just super positive and always like, you know, a hundred every day, uh, which again, I wouldn't advise. You want some some scope within that, of course. But again, perceived shape, easiest way to track it. And I think the most accurate and useful from a coach's perspective of how you're handling the, the training. The other non-scientific way of tracking it. And again, this is something Charlie Simpson, again, uh, we've had him on for webinars and stuff. Um, he talks about is like your mood basically. So what I call it is mindset. Again, on a scale of zero to hundred, how's your mindset? How's your, like your mental health as well? How is your mood? How is your, are you irritable? Are you really demotivated? Those sort of things you can kind of mix them together into like one measurement for mindset. That's really good. Now, Charlie Simpson talks about how if you are really demotivated to do an erg, then there's a good chance that your body isn't ready to do the erg. Now, that can become quite tricky. Um, you can quite easily get down, going down a rabbit hole, but if you're monitoring it correctly and you make sure that this isn't something that happens frequently and that you're not being complacent, it is good advice. And mood can be such a good um, monitor for how you're responding to training. Now, getting into the scientific ways, of measuring your response to training. HRV is one of the newest ones. Again, in rowing, there's very little of it's done. A uh, really good podcast actually is go and type in uh, Spotify or wherever, how they train uh, with Dan Plews. He, again, he was the Kiwi pairs old physiologist. He's now coaching the best triathletes in the world. He talks about how he uses HRV like as gospel, like makes loads and loads of decisions off of it. Very, very interesting. And he talks about how sometimes he really uses it to back off. But at the same time, high HRV is basically good. You're in good condition. Low HRV is bad. Um, he talks about how sometimes, you know, you will put an athlete through really hard training and it's not always a case of two weeks hard and then back off. He's like, if the HRV is high, he just keeps that athlete pushing them. And then likewise, if they're about to do really hard training, HRV is really high, they back off. Now, HRV for me, it's very important that you don't look at this on a daily basis. I wouldn't start even looking at it until you've got at least three months of data collected from it in order that you can start to spot trends, you can start to spot when you're doing too much or doing too little. Now, the best one for tracking illness in the short term, I think is really good to do is waking heart rate. So generally you want to try and figure out when you're well, track for seven days at the same time as well. Now, the best way to do it is when you wake up um, after your alarm goes off, your heart rate will peak and then it comes back down after a couple of minutes. After that peak and it comes back down, that's when you want to take your heart rate. You can do it just with a watch and count 15 seconds and count beats and then times that by four. Or you can use, again, there's there's apps out there that you can use. Um, just start tracking that consistently when you're feeling well. And then if you do that on a daily basis, if you wake up and you track your heart rate, it can be one of the first signs that if it's raised that you're about to get ill. Generally, that's if you're over seven to eight beats per minute on your waking heart rate. That's a really good method of tracking illness. I think that's probably the best ways of being responsive before you get ill, catch it before it gets worse, catch it before you do some training when you're not ready to. It can also be a good way of recording how you're responding, how you're recovering from illness is once your resting heart rate goes back down, that can be a sign that you're ready to go again. Now, this is one that I don't actually do, uh, mainly because it can be triggering for some people and there's so many other metrics you can use out there, but it's tracking body weight on a daily basis as a measurement for how you're responding to training. And generally, especially 
you know, sometimes coming back from illness, if you've lost a lot of fluid, it can be quite important that once your body weight gets back up to normal, that can be a sign that you're ready to go again. Also, when you're going through really hard training weeks, um, making sure that your body weight stays level and that you're not, you know, you're eating enough, you're fueling your engine enough. Uh, if your body weight's going down during a heavy week or heavy weeks, that can be very, very detrimental to your performance and very quickly you can result in overtraining. Now again, how to look at this data. Now generally, I'm gonna simplify this. There's much more nuance to it. And for me, generally, looking at, now actually, again, I should say, go back, look at the long-term planner video. Um, that just talks about how to plan for a long-term scale, but that's basically what you want to use with your data and see how you're responding. So figure out which data you're gonna track, You know what, how you're gonna track, if you're gonna track it consistently, and then make sure you're lining up with where you should be. So if you're in a heavy training week, if you're getting towards the end of a heavy block of training and your perceived shape, and maybe your mindset's going down a little bit, your HRV's going down a little bit, um, then that is to be expected. And to be honest, you almost want that to go down. You want to push yourself into a state of fatigue. Uh, and that's where you kind of want to push the line and look at these metrics as well and like communicate with your coach. That's something I'm really big on is making sure that like that's probably one of the best ways of getting a feel for how the athlete's responding. Likewise, in a light week, if you're getting towards the end of a light week or recovery week and those metrics are going back up, that's good. That's what we want that can be a sign that your light weeks are spot on. Now, on the other end, if you're in a heavy week and those numbers are staying high, or if you're in a heavy week and those numbers are going up, that can be a sign that you need to push more and you need to push harder. And, you know, when I bring on athletes, I wouldn't do this at the start. You know, I would. This, this is the part of me trying to figure out where the plan works best for them. But if I bring someone on and I bring them into their first heavy week and their numbers are staying the same or their numbers are going up, again, we don't have enough data at that point to collect enough information, but that's me thinking, okay, right, they're responding quite well to this. Let's just start to turn the screw a little bit, turn up the heat when it comes to those heavy weeks. And then likewise, on the light weeks, if the numbers are going down or if the numbers are staying flat, then that can be a sign that it's not light enough. Some people like, some people really need to be pushed hard in heavy weeks and go, on, go really easy in the light weeks. And some people have a much tighter span between what their heavy and light weeks are. And you know, it could often be a case that I'm looking at these numbers as a week's going on, and I'm seeing the numbers going down and it's a light week. I can go then contact them say, hey, What's going on? Is everything being all right? Assuming that I hadn't heard from them already, you know, it can often be like, yeah, you know, I have been getting no sleep last week or, you know, <laughs> most recent example of filming this is there's just been a financial crash. Well, not a financial crash, two banks crashing or three or whatever it is. Um, and the numbers will line up with it and you can almost see the numbers before it happens. You can almost see the numbers telling you what the athlete's about to tell you. And, you know, you can see the numbers dip quickly and then, you might get a message from the athlete a few a few days later being like, yeah, I'm not responding well to this. So yeah, to summarize that, make sure that your numbers are lined up with what sort of week you're in. And if they're not lined up, then you need to change your long-term planner. Now, two examples I'm gonna pull up here is again, tracking data is hard. It takes consistency. It takes like a lot of effort. So, and it takes a long time to see the reward of it. But there's two examples here that I'm gonna pull up. First off is Ben, so I'll just pull up the image here. And obviously you can see one thing that we were able to note with Ben is that we were kind of, well, he's, I was playing around with his recovery weeks and trying to figure out which recovery weeks were gonna be the best for him and how he was gonna to respond to them. Now, to not give too much away, I'll just kind of use these two examples where you can see when the weak load in red goes down, and the perceived shape goes up and the UT2 power goes up, basically that's good. And within that, I'm basically looking at, okay, what can we change? Are we looking to strip back intensity? Are we looking to strip back volume? Are we looking to strip back the kind of UT2 slash UT1 that we do? Playing around with that as well, you need to have a bit of kind of uh, experimentation with it. And then again, the communication with the athlete is the most useful, but the numbers again, looking back on it, I, 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 can't, I, I can't remember what I was saying to Ben in November. I can't remember how Ben felt in November, but these numbers can be a good representation of it. Now here we have an example of Matthias. Now again, um, 
Matthias was struggling uh, a couple of times with like illness. Again, it's something he struggled with before and we were getting better, getting him training more consistently through the right approach for him. Um, but naturally, some people are just slightly more prone to it. Me, for example, I was more prone to injury. So um, some people can just get, again, depending on work stress, depending on the immune system, can get are more likely to get ill than other people. And that's totally fine. That's what about, that's what, building the right program around somebody is all about is how can you get the most out of them regardless of how easily they get ill or how easily they get injured uh what their experiences are etc etc but here's a good example of where we thought that perceived shape was going down and fitness was going down but when we looked at the numbers especially on the long-term scale we can see that ut2 power is going up and especially through the winter Perceived shape, that's why I said it's not the be-all and end-all, but perceived shape can be so subjective and it's so, such an emotional thing. Finding that balance and sometimes just seeing the numbers can be a really good representation of progress and give you the confidence that you need to know that you're in the right direction. But again, within that, manipulating the weekly load, manipulating the high intensity, the volume, in order to get the best response out of the athlete. Okay, to summarize again, um, use this stuff it's so useful uh, <laughs> i don't know why just rowers they just you know they say rowers are normally smart but i don't know there's just this stigma around it that you know you got to be tough and you just got to pull hard every day and like you got to avo avoid the stuff that doesn't matter and just like i'm a big believer on focusing on what matters but data is useful it helps you um and you should be able to learn to like have it there and look at it and not be put off by it. I think, you know, if you're if you're not looking at data because you're afraid it's going to put you off or it's going to throw you in a downward trajectory, it's going to get you overthinking, then the problem is you. The problem is not the data. Like you should be able to look at, again, you should be able to have your phone by your bed when you're going to sleep. You should have control over like how you perceive things. And then on the flip side, again, if you do that right, it's so beneficial on like a macro scale. You don't see the benefit of it in a short term, but it's only when you, you step back and you've collected a massive amount of data. And for me, this is just all about the more, the more I can collect, the more I can get dialed into what's going to be the best fit for the athlete. And this, you know, you use these methods, you're going to figure out what you respond best to and remove yourself from like subjectivity. It's just going to give you a whole nother edge in your training. Again, if you can't be bothered setting up a spreadsheet, I'm just going to whip up a quick data tracking spreadsheet for you. I'll just have the link in the description and you can just go and request it and I'll send it over to you. All you need to do is make a copy and I'll just have like a, a quick column set up where you can track all this information and see it over a long-term scale. You can put in your weekly load as well. Use the long-term planner if you want uh, and just give yourself an idea of where you are, how you're responding to the training and start to learn more about yourself as well. But yeah, thanks for watching. You're welcome for me making this for you. If you liked it, like it, comment what you think, if you think data is useful or not, if you're a caveman or if you actually like to look at evidence, science. Um, goodbye, and we've only got one more left. Uh, so yeah, I'm still, again, I'm still filming these as we go. If you've got any suggestions, the last one is basically about moving forward. So it's again, a more sort of holistic thing that kind of encompasses say at the end of the year or the end of the winter, kind of looking back on a bunch of information and analyzing your training less so on the data scale, more on the, just like, where can you improve? How can you figure out what's next? And it's that kind of cycle of getting very focused on, um, where your weaknesses are, how to tackle them, that gets you progressing consistently and in a longer term scale. Bye!